All right, I guess we'll get started here. Uh, my name is Dustin Smith. I am uh, basically uh, replacing Johnny X. Uh, he handed this over to me last year. Uh, and welcome to Hacking 101. I have decided that we are going to do things a little bit differently this year. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, doing demonstrations, and you can ask Q&A based on that. And then after the demonstrations and all that is done, then we can just do the standard Q&A that we've always done in Hacking 101. Okay, that's fine. All right, so uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists here. Uh, we have Eric right here. Eric! <laughs> then we have Jason. Go, Jason. Savior. Randall Schwartz, which is a longtime panelist. And we have Ray over here. All right. Uh, you guys hired better fans than I did. <laughs> Apparently. Library. Okay, so I'm going to let you. I'm going to let everybody uh, give a little background about themselves, starting with Randall. Go ahead, Randall. Oh, oh, go right to me. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, what do I know? What do I do? I've been a uh, industry professional for. Well, first off, I apologize for my voice. I somehow lost my throat like. Tuesday night, just before I start doing my podcast on a Wednesday, my Floss Weekly podcast. Who here listens to Floss Weekly? Oh, nobody. Oh, my God. There's like nobody here. Oh, one, one, a couple. One, two, one, two. Okay, right. And then I had to do my talk this afternoon with this voice. So that really sucked. Uh, but you might know me not just from Floss Weekly, which I've been doing for 13 years but also from uh, some books I wrote back in the 90s uh, with the word Pearl in the title, uh, where I helped create the interactive web. And I've been coming to Dragon Gun now for 15 out of the last 17 years, so I'm really happy to be back again. They're, they haven't kicked me out yet, in spite of what Scott probably told them from last year, but yeah, I think we're probably okay. So uh, I'm here as a... Um, uh, a legendary person in the industry. <laughs> I, there's it. I mean, look, how many of us have a Wikipedia page about us? That would be me. Nope. That would be me. Okay, so there we go. That's how to define who's on. Oh, you have a Wikipedia page about you? Good. Oh, you're just waving your friend. All right. So uh, that's probably enough. Okay. Go ahead, Ray. Uh, my name is Ray Kelly. I do not have a Wikipedia page. And, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got my start in uh, uh, security probably about 18 years ago with a small startup here in Atlanta called Spy Dynamics. And we wrote one of the very first uh, automated web application security scanners. So basically, uh, it's called Web Inspect. And you type in www.yourwebsite.com, hack. And it would go and automatically go and try to hack your website. So that's kind of where my security background came from. And uh, these days with a company called Microfocus, that was after several acquisitions to HP, HP Enterprise, and now this company. And that's where I'm at now, where I do solution architecture, developing research, and whatever else they need me to do. I'm Eric Keen. I work for a wonderful com company called Secure Ideas. We do things like yeah, pen test companies. They pay us to come out and help them find their issues. Uh, I'm not a big app guy. I prefer attacking networks. That's really where I uh, find my skills lie. Before I came to security, I worked for a couple of small companies. Uh, you know, One does a small amount of banking, Bank of America, kind of small. The other one would have paid me cheese, is what I like to say, uh, down in Florida. Uh, worked for Disney for just a little bit. So, that's where I like to uh, come from. Jason? Hey. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> my name's Jason Gillum. Um, I am, I guess, programmer, security guy, web apps, mobile apps, and a bunch of other stuff, really. So, uh, a little bit of everything, yeah. Um, and I also work for Secure Ideas. We're professionally evil. If you see that tagline around, that's us. Um, we have some stickers up here we can give out later, too, if you want. So. OK. And uh, we had a yeah, late, late, I just I hacked my way into the 
the panel. Uh, no, uh, so uh, my name's Xavier Ash. I uh, um, kind of I'm a blue teamer, right? So I uh, help uh, defend against all these these pen testers down here. Um, I currently work for a bank that kind of is next door, um, and um, been hacking since the late '80s. Uh, been, been information security, actually been paying for it since the late '90s. Uh, really spent a lot of times in designing. Uh, security operation centers and uh, and putting together what what we, we you know helping big companies and medium, some medium sized companies defend against the hackers. So that's my background. Okay, uh, we are going to get started with some demonstrations shortly. Uh, as per usual with Hacking 101, we are going to be passing around a collection bucket for pizza and stuff like that tomorrow tomorrow evening at Hacking 201 for anybody who wants to donate. Uh, we do encourage you to do so. It makes it fun for everybody. Um, and I just want to go over one thing with you real quick. We are going to be doing demonstrations. Do not try these against other people's networks without permission. You may get arrested, okay? All right. So with that being said, we're going to start with Ray. He has the first demo, and I'm going to let him take it here. All righty. Okay, so the first one we're gonna start with is a vulnerability called SQL injection or SQL injection. This has been around forever. And what this allows me to do is if a website is vulnerable to this, I will steal your entire database through your website. And this is not network hacking, this is not any kind of magical uh, penetration testing, it's through your web pages that I will steal your entire database, things that aren't supposed to be accessed. So if that sounds interesting, I'll show you how we do it. So here is a typical website. This is local on my box. We are not hacking any real website right now. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of 80s big hair rock music. Any fans? Uh, all right, yeah. So here's my CD website, if people still buy CDs, uh, called stuckinthe80s.com. Typical website Oop, that I just made disappear. And I'll click on uh, some of these CDs here. We'll see there's poison, some fine looking gentlemen there. <laughs> and we have Winger. So you get the idea, it's just we're clicking through things. And now just a little bit of background I need to give you. So uh, what we're trying to steal is the database. I presume many people here know in general what a database is, right? It collects all your information. It's where all your information is stored. And that's my target, okay? And there's a certain way that databases talk. There's a language. And here's an example. Select star, which means give me everything from the employees table where the ID equals one. So basically, I'm asking the database, give me employee number one. Okay, and that's it. That's how he's, that's, and the database will go, here, here you go. Great. Simple enough. So here we can see at the end, what is this big long line called? Who knows? Shout it out. URL. Ah, you jumped ahead of me. <laughs> URL, correct, and the query parameter on the very end. Yep. And it's kind of hard to see, but we see ID equals one. And if we go back, and I'll click on another winger, and you can't see it because we're at 800 by 600, <laughs> but there is ID equals two. Simple enough. So my browser is telling the database what ID to get to give me the right album. So I'm going to go up here and just manually change it. What happens if I put, I'm just going to type one. I'm not even going to use the link. Ah, poison, okay. What if I go over here and put a three? Let's see what happens. Motley Crue, we got another one. So you get the idea. We can play with this query parameter to make it do our bidding. So now we know the relative rank of these three <laughs> bands. <laughs> so I'm going to pull up my cheat sheet here so I don't, you guys don't have to watch me type. Oh, boy. If you want to skip ahead, go to bobbytables.com. <laughs> All right, so it's kind of easier to see here. What I'm going to do is you can see product detail in the ID. So what I'm going to do, though, is instead of passing ID number, oh, to check for this first, I should have started with that. So what type of input is this right here, this one? Integer, a number. And so part of hacking, what I love doing is breaking things. I want to break this. So the developer probably assumed numbers is what I want. So what happens if I give it an A? 
oh, the app just vomited on you. And many of you may have seen this cruising around on the website. You just see this ODBC database error, some ugly messages. When I see this, I know I can steal the entire database now. The entire company is mine when I see this message. Because it said invalid column name A, it, just, it, it doesn't understand what we're trying to, it's trying to convert A to an integer. Because the attack, oh no, I'm sorry, it, it just says I don't know what A is, that's not a number, cool. So what I'm gonna do is just to check this, I'm gonna see product detail equals convert to an integer, at at version is how you, at, how you ask the database, SQL Server in specific, uh, what version are you running, SQL Server? And if you could imagine, no website should tell you this, right? Any, there's no way this should come back to the user, what version of the database I'm running. Exactly. That did not copy paste right, let's try it again. Boom, we got the same error, but now look. Conversion fail with converting the character Microsoft SQL Server 2016 with the exact version number and operating system version that I'm running. I just pulled this from the database through the website. And the problem here is the developer did not handle errors properly. They should have had a check to say, hey, if it isn't a number, tell them, hey, screw off, go somewhere else, stop messing with me. So if we want to dig a little deeper now, Here's a big ugly one. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey, SQL Server, convert the first table name that you have in your database to an integer. Because uh, the, in, within databases, there's also another table that dis explains every other table in the database. And did that not post right again? Okay, failed when converting the character DT properties. So what it did was take the first column, so now I know DT properties is a table name in the database. And what I can say is now, and I'm gonna save time, but say, hey, give me the next one after that table, and it'll give me another table, and another table, and I can dig in deeper into the data. So you can see this pretty tedious, hacking all this, right, and having to type all that. So what I like to do is just use a tool, and let me go, these are, tools that are readily available on the internet as well. Um, sorry, I gotta go back to my... Uh, on the internet, that's scary. <laughs> Supply demo. The demo god's not happy. Yes. You have some of that product name in there. Demo gods are happy. Almost there. There you go. All right, so I'm gonna take our link here and use a tool to help automate this. I'm gonna plop it in here and send it. And what we'll see, SQL injection confirmed. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit this pump data and here come all the tables in the database. I'm now sucking out the entire database through this website. Table orders, there's credit cards in here customer information, billing information. So we'll, all it's doing is talking to that web page and doing that stuff I was doing manually just in an automated fashion and digging into the database. So uh, we can click here and look at the data. So here's names, addresses. So all of this came through the website. And that's the end of SQL injection. So we'll, are there any questions before we move on? <laughs> Everyone enjoyed it? <laughs> Oh, uh, there's plenty of research. If you just Google, you know, it's not illegal to research and do things on your own. There's plenty of test apps out there and uh, with all these examples. Uh, and I think we'll have plenty of ideas of areas you can go to to learn more, but you just look and look this up on how to do it in research. Okay, we've got a uh, little cube mic on the floor. Um, I, can somebody grab it? There you go. And just uh, pass it to somebody who has their hand up. Yeah, has their hand up. Will it all just get logged somewhere? Yes, it will. It so, will get logged by the by hopefully. the company that you're hacking will have it logged. 
So can't they just track your IP address and arrest you? They can if you're not careful. That is exactly right. So why aren't you going in and erasing the logs? That's what Tor is for. <laughs> that's right. That's why I'm going to use a proxy that's in China and, and do it that way if I'm really... But, you know, amateur hackers won't do that, and you're right. The company will look at their logs if they happen to look at their logs. Do you know how many logs are on these popular websites? And who's actually going to go through the time to go look at every one of those logs and figure Someone that out? Someone who doesn't want their internet hacked. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good question. It's like one of my clients uh, gets hit by about uh, 30 or 40 of these attacks about every month or so. And so I go back and try to trace back the IP address, and it's useless because they're coming through Tor or something, so can't help. What if it's not a SQL database? What if it's something like MongoDB? Yeah, um, maybe it's others similar, have a... Uh, you can do it in a similar way. It's a little more difficult uh, with uh, NoSQL databases like Mongo or Cassandra. Yeah. Um, but kind of the easier targets are like Oracle, SQL Server, kind of the more standard databases. Also, you should never expose a MongoDB to the public Internet. There's a, They don't really have any security. So you really want to put it behind some sort of Nginx proxy or something that has like a second level of... Uh, security before you do that. So just in case there are other programmers out there, how do you stop SQL injection from happening, please? Yeah, so this one is actually kind of easy, right? Uh, what was one of the examples we said? Uh, it's basically clean your inputs, watch your inputs. So the example we had, the developer should have said, if it's not a number, throw an error. Yeah, parameter tri uh, parameterized queries as well. Store procedures is another method. But the biggest one, you know, that's sort of band-aiding. You know, the front end should be validating the input. And to be even more specific, if you're taking, let's say, a zip code, you know, why not accept only five digits? Be very specific, uh, you know, for whitelisting versus blacklisting. Unless you're in Canada or the <laughs> UK. And uh, uh, again, bobbytables.com. I wasn't joking about that website. Bobby Tables talks about a lot of this stuff. So, uh, like I said, I was, I'm, I'm blue team, right? I never trust our programmers to do it right. Mm -hmm. So there's there's additional band-aids I can put in front of it, and it's called a web application firewall. A web application firewall looks at those uh, those calls coming in and looks for SQL statements within the URL and looks for other types of attacks, th these application level attacks, and tries to block them. So so the the the, the right way to do it is, is 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 proper secure coding, and then the 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 you know blue team you know thing that we put on top of that to make sure that, that even if that gets all the way through to production is a web application firewall. Good question. Any more questions? I just want to know what websites would you recommend doing this on? Two. 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 I'm You're sorry. Is it, <laughs> what websites would you recommend doing this to? Doing it to? Yeah. <laughs> yes, your own. Yeah, one good. that you get permission <laughs> from. I mean, this is, right. if, if you were to do this on a public website, this could be illegal. So everybody, make sure you understand that. Make sure you have permission. This is not something to do to other people's websites. And, and remember, there are FBI people in here right now, so be careful. <laughs> and it's being recorded. And there's plenty of websites that you can download on your own that are purposely vulnerable for you to practice and learn how to do this. Yeah, so like if you go to OWASP.org, um, that's a popular for web application security. And uh, WebGoat, I believe, is vulnerable to SQL injection. We've got one so. right here, actually, too. Okay, uh, which one is Juice that? This is OWASP Juice Shop. Juice Shop, okay. So yeah. there, there's OWASP, and it's, it's hard to pronounce. O-W-A-S-P. What's that stand for? Open Web Application Security. Open Web Application. Open Web Application Security. Security Project. Project. There you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we'll have more time at the end. We want to get through, make sure we get through all the demos and then we'll have more questions at the end. So. I just have one quick question for Xavier, oh, yes. specifically around this. How much automated testing does your team like yours do in order to prevent what would be considered common issues like this in code? All right, so I'm not gonna say what my company does because you might bank with us and you might want to know, you know, not know yeah. where exactly our, our problems are at. But uh, in general, what you do is, there's several layers you want. There's a uh, you can add a uh, a plugin into the programming interface that the programmers use to look for programming errors, security errors inside your IDE, and and then there is static code analysis. There's dynamic code analysis, and and so the, you know basically you want to try to find the bug early as possible, 
uh, in what we call push to the left. It's basically as soon as the co coder is writing it, uh, as soon as we can try to detect that security error before it goes all the way into production. That's the idea. So this is, is catch it because it's cheaper to fix the earlier in the process. But one key ingredient always is never let data become code. Never let data become code. Because once you've done that, you've increased the possibility that somebody can inject bad data that becomes bad code. And your code should never be data. Your data should never be code. They should be totally separate pathways. Okay. All right. Good. Are we ready for the next one? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, what I'd like to show is something called cross-site scripting. Anyone heard of that one before? Cross-site yeah. scripting. Speaking of my cross-site scripting. Yeah. Okay. I got to bring this microphone closer. Yeah. There we go. Speak up. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is another one that happens to the website. Now, where I'm doing this, I was mentioning before. This is the OWASP Juice Shop website, which is. It's one that you, you would install, and it's a, it's a purposely broken website. It has lots of vulnerabilities on it, so it's a good place to practice if you're getting into hacking websites. Um, this one in particular is running on a, uh, inside of a virtual machine that is the, the uh, Samurai Web Testing Framework. Samurai WTF, that's, that's what it stands for, I promise. <laughs> Nothing what, else. What the frack? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, just jumping into it here. So in this one here, it's set up so it's a um, like a online store. We're buying fruit stuff, and uh, one of the fields on here is is a search box. And if I type something in there, I know this is hard to see. I'm going to just type carrot. Um, what we notice is that the word carrot shows up on the page. It actually also shows up in the URL as well. So we have this characteristic of the website that we call reflection that's occurring, right? We put something in, it shows back up on the website. So what we're interested in doing with cross-site scripting is seeing if I can put something that is not just data, but if I can put something that's code that runs inside the browser or JavaScript in there as well and have that work. There's a few different ways of doing that. Um, in this case here, I'm going to create, I'm going to try a image tag. So I'm going to type image source. I'm going to use an image that I know doesn't exist. So I'm just putting the word foo on there. And then I'm going to say on error. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's very small. It's very small. Have... You're not going to be able to see it. So on error equals JavaScript. And then what is, we can look at it again later. Smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors, yes. And now I'm going to, all I'm putting in here is an alert box. So for those of you familiar with JavaScript, you should know what that is. Uh, and then I'm going to close out the on error and close up the tag and hit go. And what happens, we see we got this pop-up that showed up on there, right? So this is the classic indicator in cross-site scripting that you'll see when a pen tester is saying, hey, something's broken on this website, I can cross-site script it. It doesn't look like much right here because all we're getting is this pop-up box. But what happened was I was able to, it, this demonstrates that I was able to actually get code to run inside of the browser. So that's the first part. I'm gonna take this just a little bit further. Maybe this will be a little bit more visible as well. So I'm gonna open up on the side. Hang on, let me clear that out. There's full screen. Can I full screen this? Control yeah. plus. Enhance. How's that? Enhance. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Hang on. Uh, let me just clear that out. Okay. So, what we have here is um, there's a, a little bit of code that will load a script from somewhere else. Because that's one thing, right? It's one thing for, for me to be able to say, okay, well, I put some code into my own browser. I'm just hacking myself. But we want to take that a little bit further than that. We want to be able to have a payload that we can give to victims. Again, I'm thinking from the attacker point of view, and have them execute. So uh, I am going to take this one here, which is 
very similar to what I just did, except that, oops, hang on. It's still an image tag, only this time it's going to iterate over um, all of the fields on the page. It's going to do two things. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. No, no. Uh, you can can't. You do, can you do a control plus on that? Enhance. I tried to do that earlier and it broke on the screen, so oh, okay. it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry. <It's> vulnerable. <laughs> the screen. Yeah, it's the, the projector doesn't uh, doesn't scale. Everybody well. move forward. <laughs> Everybody go stand with These demos are always hard this way. So. Well, that's a good idea. Oh, wait, yeah, the lights. The lights can come down. What's that? They have control. We don't need to see each other. Everybody keep your hands to yourself. They did it in the last panel, so they can drop those lights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, oh, there we go. Oh. Okay. All right. Enhanced. <laughs> Let me go back one step since Still we were interrupted useful. there. Still not useful. Okay, so this time what I did in the search box. I think I see it, a milkshake. Yeah. Banana apple for scale. juice. It's apple juice, but close. <laughs> okay, ins inside the search box again, again, we're still working with the search field. It's loading a script from another site that I have running. Okay, so this is from somewhere else. And that script, what it's going to do is it's going to, uh, first thing, it's going to actually switch us over to the login page, just magically. And then, it's going to start recording what's happening on that logging page. So this is known as a key logger. It's a rudimentary type of key logger. All right, so we hit that. Um, it automatically moved me to the login page. And now we can see, if I start typing stuff in the fields, see all of that occurring down that right-hand side? That's the console for the browser, so that means I'm actually controlling, or I'm actually able to capture each of those keystrokes. The next step on this, which I'm not gonna do it right now, maybe we'll do it to, uh, tomorrow in Hacker uh, 201, would be to have a way to take that data as we're typing it in and then send it to the attacker's location, right? To, to some website that they own. And that's, that's if you anybody in here is a um, progr uh, programmer, does JavaScript, you should know that's pretty trivial at this point. You already have access to the data. It's already running inside the context of the browser. So um, that's it for cross-site scripting. Any questions? Let's. <laughs> Where, where's hey, the let's get the, uh, the microphone the up here. There we go. So why did you use the image tags on error attribute as opposed to just using a script tag? Uh, good question. So, the in this case, so this has to do with how the page loads. This is a single page app. Um, if I use just a script tag on here, it wouldn't actually execute the script. It would just put it onto the page, and it would be there, but it wouldn't actually run it. By putting the image tag with the error, the browser actually will try to load the image and fail, and then it actually runs the er the uh, error script. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, another one back there. A couple, yeah. So in this case, you've typed in the search field yourself. How yes. exactly do you make somebody else execute this script? Good question. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, it's a little harder to do it I, with. I think I have a scenario, though. So what I would do with this, if I knew a website was vulnerable, let's say Acme Bank, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send spam messages out in email that says, hey, you're, you need to check your username and password on your bank website. Everyone sees from their bank, right? Say, hey, log into your website. What I would do is send a malicious link that would include the payload in the email so that when they click it, you actually go and it loads the script. And as you're typing, it's actually key logging from the, e you know, because you use the link in the email. Um, you know, so through a phishing attack would be one method as well. And it, yeah. tur it turns out an unfortunate number of um, um, BBS systems, uh, people that are places where you can make comments, also allow for this sort of stuff to be injected yeah. into messages. And then people will read the messages and be vulnerable to attacks like it's, this. It's distributed through social engineering, basically. So it's, hey, can you click this link? In this, in this particular case, it got hidden because it switched to the login page. But if, if you look at, I don't know if you can see at the top right now, but there's a really long URL on there. The entire payload got um, encoded, URL encoded on there. So that is actually, could be distributed as a link. We could use an, a URL shortener or something. I was just gonna follow up on that. Question. The other... Hang on, let's get the mic over. We got the mic. 
Okay, well, there was a mic. Oh, we got one back there. Well, if you had a question. Well, yeah, let's go. Your next Um, So I actually want to get started on learning how to hack. What are some tools to help me get started? <laughs> That's a, tools to help you start getting uh, to start okay. getting into hacking. We'll, we'll discuss that separately. You, 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 you should get a lawyer. Uh, get a lawyer uh, first. Here, here you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll ask after so, we'll so, so we mentioned the o OWASP. Okay, that's this great acronym to remember. O O W S P. All right, and if you go to you Google OWASP, they got a website, and they've got what we call the OWASP Top Ten. Right, and and what we're touching here is is that we you know these are the top ten vulnerabilities that get hacked. And it goes in, in that web page, it, 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 it's where you, they, they will tell you how the vulnerability works and will go into, here's how you can you know, practice it. Like I said, these, these things have been downloaded from the OS website. So, so the answer to your question is really to go to the OS uh, website is a really good place to get started. Kali Linux is also a good solution to get into it. Yeah. Well. Yeah, one more the question up here. Oh, uh, there we go. Check the box. I was just going to say that the uh, other way to take advantage of CSS is anytime that there is a website where you can put something on the website that other people are able to see. Because then you can put your payload in that area, like comments on Facebook or the tweets on Twitter, stuff like that, that kind of thing. Right, yeah. So that, that brings up a good point. So there's there's two, there, some people say there's more than two, but there's two basic types of cross-site scripting. One's called reflected, right? So that's when I put something in and it immediately pops back. The other one is is stored or persisted. And that is, that is where you have a situation uh, like the comment field where you have a place you can put something that other people will come and visit at a later time. So... There's variations on those too. Any other questions about this? Back here. Uh, we're not doing that. I can't catch you. This is more of a higher level question. Not sure there's a good answer. How much of these or how many how much of this vulnerability could be avoided if if JavaScript was just not such a terrible language? <laughs> if, I didn't catch the end. I don't think you want to go there. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if we could a, attack JavaScript. I mean, JavaScript's not that bad. JavaScript isn't the evil here. It's how it's being utilized by the developer. Again, sanitizing those inputs. Why in a search field did it allow the word script in there, right? Why wasn't that stripped out of the, of the search, right? And it really comes back to what I said earlier, which is do not let data become code. Ever. Yeah. Do not let data become code. So the, the solution on this one is actually not that much different than it is for for um, the SQL injection. Exactly. Right. It's still sanitizing your input. Uh, we got a couple more questions out here. Oh I think. wow! Yeah. We got pop up questions now. One over here. Excited what that? by what we're talking. Uh, about. Cores. Hmm? Cores. 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 Use oh, cores. as a protection mechanism? Cor cores pol using cores policies? Um, cores isn't enough. <laughs> Not for this. No, uh, that's uh, so. Cores isn't isn't really a protection what, what's, so much. What's cores? Cross. It's a cross origin resource sharing. Is yeah. is what it is. It's a it's a mechanism that's used. So basically, it's the way that websites currently do mashups. Right, so if you have you have one website that needs to get some data from another website and show that all in one view, it's going to use a course policy to do so. But there are some problems with course policies, or there can be if they're not set up properly. That's actually a common problem that we'll see in a lot of web applications. It's just configurations that are bad. People just they don't really know how to do it right, so they they uh, set up the configuration wrong. Not just for cores, but for other things too. And if the JavaScript is coming from the site already. Uh it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're coming from the same origin, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and browsers now ha are doing a better job within the browser. There's a specific headers, the X frame uh, headers, so you can say same origin to make so that the browser is ensuring that you can't include JavaScript from your another malicious website. But not all browsers support those equally, so yeah. uh, you just have to be careful with that as well. It's that's also not a 100% solution. So. Sanitizing the inputs is a pretty solid way to go about it, but you know, multiple levels of protection is also good. 
If you build a smarter tool, the world will create a worse developer. It balances out in the end. <laughs> <laughs> we had a couple more questions in the back. Go through uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, ask if you could clarify on what you meant by um, make sure data is not code. I, I think I'm on the same page as you, just, just to make sure that you, um, can you just talk a little bit about that? You want me to talk more about my policy about make sure data is never code? <laughs> Please, yes. <laughs> well, okay, so the, the easiest example, of course, is an SQL. Recognizing that you should be using, you know, question mark parameters rather than trying to insert the text of your value into the middle of your SQL. And the same thing is true about when you're dealing with JavaScript. Don't insert text into the middle of your, of your JavaScript. It should all be done with values and parameters. So that way the data can never be reinterpreted as code. So it's, it's important to keep that in mind as you're dealing with it. Every language has the ability to do that. Every programmer sometimes does not have the ability to do that. And that's the problem. Okay, thank you. Oh, is it ready? All right, so we'll have more time for questions still at the end, so we'll yeah, let's go on to the next demo. Do this sure. All right, so we've done technical demos, and this will be somewhat technical, but not in the same way. Who works at a company who does phishing campaigns to see if you click on links. <laughs> How many people click on links? Oh, uh, come on, be honest. Who we clicks all on links? Click on Who links. clicks on links from friends? Your Not even at work. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Who clicks on links in Facebook? Uh, how many people have a one by one pixel in every image they get? Yeah. Every, every <laughs> there you go. They get. All right. So. What I'm going to show here is how people can play with this, right? Everybody says, hey, we can spot phishing. We don't click on bad links. We look for things to say, this is a bad link. I would never want to go there, right? Everybody's heard this. You hover over it. You do all these things. Who thinks they're really good at spotting bad links? All right, we're going to test you. So here we go. We showed the beginning. We're going to start out easy. Which ones are the bad ones here? Which ones are the bad links? All of them. Are okay, okay, you're right. All of them. Why is the first one bad? It's not a huh? That's right. All right. These are easy, right? You, everybody can pick those out. What's wrong with three? There's only three. What's wrong with three? What? You know what? That's a good one. It's the eye. That's not a real eye. Ooh. Isn't that nifty? It's a magic eye. All right, but hold on now. All right, so you guys picked them out. There you are, right? You have the CL instead of a D. That one's really easy, I admit. Now you have that strange eye because it's a little quirky, right? It's leaning to the right. You have the long eye. Then you have a second different long eye that goes further down, right? Is that that Turkish dotted eye? Yeah, huh? Is that the or Spanish exclamation point and a number of things. The S and then an I without a dot. The I without a dot actually gets most people, believe That's it or not. That's the Turkish eye. It is. So, all right, here we go. Next one. All right, which one's a bad link? All of them. All of them. That is incorrect. There is a bad, there is a good link in there. What's the source? How do we know? Hmm? Uh, hover over. <laughs> that actually does not work. No? No. So if somebody said hover over, I, it, we'll see. Can we, can I get a mouse? I pick four. You pick four as a bad one? All right. Honestly, number three, as I go, no, you're right. Number four is right. Darn it. Did you just guess? No. All right, how'd you pick it out? I want to know. Come up here and tell me how you showed. You picked it out. Yeah, come on. It is my secret. It's my, yeah, oh, darn it. You're right. It is number four. That is a valid link. The rest are wrong, right? How, why? That's a great question. Okay, so if everybody spoke English, right, and everybody used the exact same alphabet across the world, we wouldn't have this problem. But people use different alphabets, right? The favorite for attackers like us is Cyrillic, right? Russian, right? That area. Because there's so many characters that in the Russian language look identical to English, to us, right? Visibly, they look the same. However, to a computer, they're absolutely 100% different, okay? So let's look at it. We'll go through the first one. This is the DZE, is in like pods, okay? Now, I don't speak Russian or anything, so if I butcher it, yeah, sorry, if you speak Russian and I butcher it, I, I apologize, but here you go. So this is the S, right? So all of them, if you look at the different fonts, it kind of shows up differently. So an attacker using 
you know, who wants to send you a bad email needs to know what they're actually sending it as, right, so you can see. The ones at the top there, I picked them because those are your typical web fonts, okay? So this is what every computer, it might be a different name depending on your operating system, but it's the same overall, right? And you notice they're actually kind of hard to tell from the normal S there, right? Lado is a little different. That's a, a newer one. It's new to Microsoft especially, but you can see how much easier it is to pick it out there, right? But at the bottom, that's actually what it comes out as to your computer. That's how it interprets it and what it does. So as an attacker, what I do is I send you that email and it says, hey, come to my site, look at my awesome new videos, whatever it is, secureideas.com. Hey, everybody trusts that place already. They're great guys, right? They don't do anything unless we've actually paid them to attack us, right? Well, if I send it to you, you see that, you enter it, everything looks exactly normal to you. However, the computer on the back end is going to change into that strange name, which I have registered as a malicious website because that's a DNS name, right? I registered it, you go there, and that site that you think is Secure Ideas is not because it's some XN Secure Ideas. So the next one, Cyrillic A, same general idea, right? Over and over and over again. And as I said, the important thing is even if you hover over it, Oh, that's so ugly. <laughs> Where's a mouse? I need a mouse. Sorry. I have no I mouse. Have, I have a trackball. Even if you hover over it, it is so small. I wish you could see it. You can't tell. Uh, even if you hover over these, all you see is exactly what I wanted to show you. There's nothing special about that. All right? So there you go. This is why you should never, ever, 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 everybody say it, ever, <laughs> click on a link. Okay? <laughs> Never go there. If you're, going, if you're being told to go somewhere, that's great. Go there. Everybody knows Facebook. You don't need to click on my link to Facebook, right? When you get the HR thing from your company saying, hey, it's time to go sign in, do your yearly assessment, pick your HR, don't click the link, okay? We do campaigns quite often for our clients. I wish we did them less. I don't like phishing. I hate lying, actually. I'm, I'm horrible at lying. <laughs> you may not believe it. I'm, anybody play D&D? Okay, I'm a paladin. Swear to God, I'm a lawful good paladin. Okay, that is me. I can't lie. I do it horribly. You know, we do physical pen tests, and I'm like, please don't look at me. Okay, so <clears throat> what it comes down to is we do fishing campaigns. We did one campaign, right? Had a good time. It was around October. Okay, we managed to get the VPs, the VP of HR, their name, how they sign things. Okay, and we said, you know what? Next year, your policies are gonna change and you're gonna have to spend a considerable different amount of money, okay? Please go here, sign in, check your new rates to know what you'll be paying next year. How many people clicked on that link in that company? <laughs> oh, like 98%, there were 2% who were like on vacation or something. Guess who else clicked on it? Wait, who else clicked on it? CEO. No, the VP of HR. <laughs> All right? Phishing works on its own when you add these things in here because you can just change names. It's almost impossible to detect. There's no way to know. So please stop clicking on links. Yep. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> so there you go. Questions? Yes? Once you click on it and go to the site, is it apparent? Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. If you click on the link and look at the URL in the browser itself, does it become any more apparent? Not always. It depends on the browser. So things like Chrome, Chrome kind of catches it, but what happens is when you put it in for that split second, it's going to quickly, before you hit enter, show what you're really going to. But I mean, it's like that. So you go, go, you're not going to see it. If you click it, you'll never see it. Because it forwards instantly to the other Correct. site. Correct. So if you, you know, so if you copy and paste and you put the URL in there, for that split second before you hit go, you might see a little pop-up that says it, well, but what it's about browser you, dependent. What about if you post it into Notepad? or something else that's pure text. You, you will not see it same because it, it will font. render it exactly like it looks. Because once again, it's a Unicode character. So yeah. your computer says, hey, this is what it is. And all questions, we, we can direct questions towards him based on this discussion right here. Or if you have general questions, that's fine too. I'm going to go ahead and start passing around the collection bucket. If only the world just used to ask you like we do. Exactly. If everybody spoke English, we'd be eight, fine. Eight bits is good enough for, you know. And you only need no, 32 seven bits. of RAM. Seven, seven bits is good enough for the Bible. 
Ooh. <laughs> Uh, so you mentioned Facebook. Uh, I know better if it's in my email, it's like, oh, hey, your bank's compromised. Click oh, on this. Geez. If I'm putting in my information, I know better than to click a link. But if it's like, hey, read this crap, how am I vulnerable if I don't put anything in? So if you don't, no, no. So in this case, it doesn't make a difference if you put anything in. So we talked about cross-site scripting, running code in the browser, doing whatever. You click on that link, and you're going to do whatever I tell your browser to do. Okay, so it might look like a web page, all right? The simplest thing would be I'm going to copy a web page that you're expecting good to go to, yeah. and I'm going to have that login that you expect to see, and it's going to say, hey, log in. You log it, I capture it, and I immediately forward you to your real page, and it says, you entered your password incorrectly, please enter it again. But that's like minor, right? Once again, I'm a network guy, so what am I going to do? I'm going to drop something on your computer that says it's mine. Okay, I am you, I'm going to do whatever I want on your computer, and be you, okay? Don't click the link. Cool. Any other questions? There's a question up here, can we have the microphone? In the front, in the front. So yeah. I, know, I know, don't click the link, but is there uh, any sites out there that you could paste the link into and it checks to see what it does or U where it goes? URLscan.io URL is my favorite. URL. You, so let me repeat that. URLscan.io. Nice. So URLscan.io will will go out and look at that website. It'll take a picture of it. It'll tell you all sorts of very technical information if you are, are, are so so inclined. And it will let you know some trust levels if other people have identified that site as known bad. Um, one of the, the, the telltale signs of a phishing campaign is the age of the DNS. So if we got one of these guys down here that are launching a, a penetration test against your company, they're going to they're gonna create that thing that he just did within, you know, a, a, a decent amount of days. And so, I, you know, one of the things I set up, and, and like I said, the blue team, I, I try to defend against this stuff, is look at the age of the DNS entry. And if the age of the DNS entry is not very old, then we block the sites. And so that's one way of detecting it. So when you go to urlscan.io, that'll be one of the I'm going to counter that with you're right. During uh, my pen test, yep. if it's a short one, you're right. But a malicious attacker could have had that for years. True. It's, it's not a silver bullet. No. Uh, absolutely. I, just, I mean, I that's just one layer of defense is. that we have. I just so. don't want to say it's, it's everything. No, it's that's not right. everything. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Question over here. Or over there. Would a simple solution be to cut not and just paste, but cut into a um, a clipboard? No, unfortunately, once again, because it it is a Unicode a Unicode character, right? So everywhere you put it, it's going to look exactly that way. Yeah, you're, right. yeah. The opera, any notepad or whatever is going to be Anything. as helpful as possible and try to render it properly. Now you could save as ASCII. And have an ASCII document pasted and then you'd in see there. Some strange character. Yeah, it'd be garbage at that point. Then you would know. But I mean, who's really going to go through? The, all sad, of that? For the sad part is <laughs> right. there's like 47 ways for the letter I to yeah. show up in Unicode. I just picked some, right? Once again, this was a—it's not there anymore. This was a small sample of the ways right, to do yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, so once again, your, your two choices are: I get a link. I'm going to spend three <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Copying, pasting, saving, looking, sending it to a website, looking, checking, going here, looking in second. If somewhere in the URL you the see an emoji poo, you know that's not a good yeah. URL. So, so a, you, a bunch of you guys have raised your hands when you talk about your your team, your your company's running automated testing on phishing. However, if you go and use the the the, the, comp, the, the URL uh, URL scan.io that I mentioned. One of the things that the testing does is it puts a little question mark and an ID on the end of it. And that is a very special code that means you. You click that link. That's how he knows that a VP of, of, uh, H, uh, of HR clicked the link is because it's, uh, cause when we send these tests out to everyone, everybody in the company gets a unique code and we know who clicks the link. We can track it back to an individual. This was Xavier Ash that clicked the link. Now, if you go to urlscan.o and you paste that in and you find, oh, this was one of those testing guys, I caught you, but guess what? Urlscan.io just went to that link and therefore you're going to show up on their uh, test yeah. as being one of the persons that clicked the link. <laughs> so they just just know that. Yeah. You know, that's how they that's uh, how I was researching. Yeah. I, I was researching. researching. I, I just wanted to know. Time. Like I I caught you, but yet I'm still gonna show up on the bad list. And so there you go. So one more thing. Fishing campaigns, minor thing on my part. 
Step one is, hey, who clicked the link? You know what's more important in those campaigns? To say, hey, forward it on to say, it was, you know, I think this is questionable, right? So many companies are focused on, you click the link, you're bad. The, the real idea for these is supposed to be, you know what, I think this is fishy. You sh your company should have something like uh, bad mail or spam, whatever. Abuse. Send yeah. Abuse. I, That's I, a classic. I am actually that person, and they forward it to me, and me and my coworkers say, hey, this looks fishy, should I click it? And I'm like, I love you. There you go. See? All right, Straight everybody send it to her. Right, right her. Everybody got the right Get her right email right. address and send it to her from this point. Kudos. Kudos. Questions about anything, not just fishing. Please, not just fishing. And in previous years, we've also talked not just about computer hacking, but about people hacking. So if people have people hacking questions, please uh, introduce so, those. Uh, our next-gen firewalls with cloud-based um, payload comparison. Do you think that's offloading a lot of best practices devs need when like coding websites? Uh, wow. So that. Uh, mm. All right. So, <laughs> so <laughs> my opinion, or we could get everybody. So the, the, the you can't hear him. The question was: Are next gen firewalls and other automated tools like WAFs, etc., uh, are they actually causing more problems? Right. We're seeing. Not, well, yeah, not necessarily causing more uh, problems, but just like. Maybe the best practices of people the aren't following best practices. Needed, yeah, yeah. Aren't so, so much of the future. My perspective, not nap guy, right? Take it for what you will. I'm going to say yes, right? Only from my own experience recently. A lot of what I've seen in my tests, and Jason has seen a lot more, so you can comment, is people are relying on frameworks, okay? Which mm -hmm. a lot of frameworks help actually protect you, which is great. But then suddenly they do something that's not in that framework. And it's, it's pot, right? It's horrible. And we can do whatever we want. We can cross-site script or whatever, right? Um, so they are all tools to help you. Nothing is going to be better than having a knowledgeable, knowledgeable developer writing secure code. Really, so it's all about knowing from the beginning and doing the best practices. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I would add too, so we see, you know, we deal specifically in application security. And what I've seen in a good way is that I haven't run into any customer to say, well, we have a WAF, so we're not going to do secure coding <laughs> techniques. We're not going to do uh, other techniques or uh, static code analysis. What I'm finding is people are, even when they do have WAFs or next generation firewalls, they are still doing some additional on top of that, which is good. Yeah, it's just kind of a little extra measure on top, yeah. but right. there's lazy people. Another sure, story. sure. Yeah. Funny story about a WAF. I didn't run this test, so third party, right on my end here. But so we were brought in, and we were told to do an application pen, te uh, pen test. And we said, okay, uh, typically when we do a pen test, we say we don't want you to have your WAF in front of us. We don't want to be trying to beat our head against it because we want to test your application, just like you said. Well, these, this company, this client said, we just bought a WAF. Don't worry, you are not going to be affected by it. Great. Run the test. We do everything, only to find out that they put the WAF in learning mode. Yep. We just trained it how to accept everything bad, right? So <laughs> it was perfect on our end. Uh, so you have to remember, it. they're they're kind of smart, right? They yeah. learn over time. You know, know what you're doing and what you're what tool you're implementing and when you've implemented it before you have it be tested. Yeah. So so WAFs is 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 very can be very hard to to, to to tune, right? So it is not a very simple drop in and 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 uh, it works effectively tool, kind of like IDSs. IDSs, we generally just turn on some stuff and, and it, it pretty much works. WAFs, you have to really have the, the WAF engineer be part of the, the program, uh, of the, the programming, you know, life cycle, so that for every version that gets released out to, you know, you're, you're continuing to tune that. And I've worked for many companies that don't realize that they may they have a security guy do the WAF, and it's like, I, this guy knows bits and bytes and, and IPs and whatnot, but not the, the, the programming side of it. So you need, uh, so WAFs is, is, is not a, uh, a, a, a fail safe that, oh, I've got a WAF, I'm safe. Uh, it's it's, it's it's there's a very wide margin and very you know well tuned wow. yeah and the reason I kind of ask is I see like a lot of Apollos out there that people think it's plug and play and no. nothing's really configured or tuned yeah. so turn it on like, during, the pen test. during the pen test Amazon, perfect time. Yeah. Amazon <laughs> WAF is another one uh, you know it's, it's it, it, it seems like it works out of the box but you still no, have yeah to, you yeah. still have to do something yeah, with a it. lot of cool. tuning yeah thank you question somebody in the back question way in the back, way in the back. <laughs> no medical incidents. Don't peck Two minutes. You signed the, the waiver, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, so uh, actually, working infrastructure security, kind of. 
I am uh, beholden to a uh, army of developers that run around like hamsters. Um, one of the things I have to deal with pretty regularly, and I, I don't know, get your take on it is, uh, what kind of layers of security do you put around containers? Because <laughs> any developer with an internet connection uses them. Containers. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, containers. that's a good one. Um... A lot. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm finding out. More than one. It's and and it's and it's a sliding. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a moving target, right? So, uh, one of the things is that we didn't have with containers for a while was was distinct UIDs. Now now we can get that you know, that accomplished and be able to run something as as a, as a virtual UID, and and so that's it's helped a lot. Um, yeah, it's that's not an easy answer. It's it's, it's one. Of that might be a two hundred one yeah, question. That, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I was uh, holding out hope. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you many times I've read the Docker file, and for some reason they thought it was a good idea to load a volume as part of the Docker file. Yeah, right, yeah, I love that. So. I, I, I would say that I mean it's one of the things that, that I love about Docker and and and, and containers in general is this this concept of immutable you know things whether it's a container or a VM however you want to run it and you can get this in the, in the cloud you know if, if you're doing you know uh, cloud native applications is being able to you know uh, to, to promote that you know throughout the system and you're testing the actual container throughout your process and that's the one that goes live uh, you know doing that doing that right being able to shift that mentality hey I'm, I I don't need to patch Right, I, I need to replace, and and uh, uh, if if you can get that that shift in mentality down, you can really move your your security uh, risk framework. But still, like I said, it's an, still emerging technology. It's got lots of like under underpins that you've got to you got to nail. And one, and one of the biggest issues now is that you if you trust Docker Hub for your uh, base images. There's been known vulnerabilities in Docker Hub. And so you're building your entire infrastructure on software that has known vulnerabilities. And unless you're paying attention to that, you're gonna be messed up big time. And that, that hasn't been addressed by anybody. Everybody's trusting all of that infrastructure from Docker Hub down. Unless you're building your own images from scratch, uh, you're you you know so like I, I yeah. my primary client right now is ZipRecruiter, and we're building everything from scratch, and we have our own ECR in AWS to say because we want to control every single bit of everything we're running, and you can't rely on Docker Hub for anything. At this point. So back, back to your your question, though. Uh, so I actually get pretty excited about the direction of development these days with cloud uh, deployments. You get into DevOps, agile development, and yeah. uh, and containerization. And, and one of the really cool things that's happening there is you have your your configuration is basically code. It's all source controlled, which is kind of cool because as things change in your configuration for your containers, you have an opportunity to then review that and catch things. Um, as they're going through, so it's really you got to plug yourself into the process to take advantage of it. I have just like a closing statement. I would say one thing that I've had to adjust to because it is, like you said, more of an agile project-based work uh, workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, being the security guy sucks because oftentimes you get to say uh, no, you can't move forward because this will blow everything wide open. Stop. Yeah. Um, and no one likes it when you tell them that. And you get very angry looks. So um, some of the part of the adjustment is like saying, OK, you can do that, but here's the risk. Go ask your adult. <laughs> yeah, that, that is true. I mean, that's an on, I, I've heard that from a lot of organizations. It's, it's, it's an ongoing battle. Can I just say though, at, at some point you've got to trust something, right? Absolutely. And no. that, um, no. not really. And and do I trust the hundreds, if not thousands, of developers that are working on the cloud and are probably better than my developers to secure things, or do I spend some time, right, in trying to write something like a Docker Hub, right, with my three developers that are doing it in their spare time? So where do I stop? Do I stop in the well, actually, I don't trust Intel in doing their uh, CPUs right. 
Oh, damn. What happened last year, right? I've got to trust somewhere. And so you can't just say, oh, I'm going to write everything from scratch. Can you read Ken Thompson's reflection on trusting trust? Yes. I, I, I think you have to start compute. trusting somewhere. I think yeah. you have to compute the relative risk. Yeah. There, there's no absolute ability to avoid risk. If there was, you know, we wouldn't be able to walk outside tonight. You know, there, there, you have to have the knowledge that there's a risk in everything you do. And you have to be able to compute that in to your business plan. And uh, you're not a businessman if you can't do that. So um, I didn't come with any prepared slides, but one of the things I wanted to bring up tonight is uh, IPv6. And so IPv6 is an interesting character because uh, a lot of people don't realize how well it works. It, it, it was designed very well to just work. And, and without going into the technical details, one of the things that we've gotten used to is network address translation, or NAT, right? You go home and your home router is, is NATing the public internet, uh, and then you've got all of your internal you know, uh, stuff right inside your house. Chromecast, uh, you know, uh, uh, Apple, uh, I, I, I TV, and all the stuff like that. All right, so IPv6 doesn't have NAT. Yeah, it does. Well, but here's the thing: you 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 don't need it. You don't need it. But it doesn't work. I mean, the, the, you're not natting IPv6. So if I knew your IPv6 address to your Chromecast, I could address it from anywhere on the internet. Now, without the one, firewall. Well, I mean, any home router, the the, the IPv6 is not you know, is not blocking. And so here's the thing: is 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 is, is it the one of the nice things is is that the IP address space for IPv6 is so huge that we can we are not anywhere near being able to scan it in our lifetime, right? There, there's just massive amount. So like IPv4, I can set up a mass scan. We might do this in a, you know to a one is is to go through and you can scan the entire IP space you know in a matter of hours in IPv4. IPv6, it will take, you know, thousands of years. And so, so we can, we're not being directly hacked because of IPv6, but I, and anybody that is, I heard some people talk about it being part of infrastructure support, is to, is to take that back, is to take a look at your, you know, to, you know challenge your uh, IPv6 blocking policies and, and make sure that that sucker is tested. And that if you, you uh, don't realize that, that and you're not effectively blocking IPv6 at your edge routers, it is getting out. And it is, that is becoming more, we are, are be getting better and better at being able to detect IPv6 traffic on the web and be able to get back to those individual uh, addresses. A part of a project that's building a program to kind of guess using special math and all sorts of ML and IA, uh, AI and crap to, to come down and figure out of the, the vast IP space that is IPv6, where to scan those. And so if, if we're, you know, so want to walk away with this, you know, the, the puny code is a great lesson to learn, the, the, you know, the special eyes and whatnot, but the other one to walk away with tonight is, is IPv6 and the fact that it doesn't do network address translation on, by default. Uh, well, it can, but it doesn't. I, I, and also, I have personally five slash 48s in the IPv6 space, so I can number all the grains of sand with their own address 20 times over. Incorrect. Yeah, IPv6 has an ungodly amount of addresses. It's in the undecillions. Yeah. And more questions? Yeah. I see one over there. Uh, so I work for a very large, very popular uh, uh, television broadcasting company. And one of the interesting things that I learned upon starting there is that for a certain subset of their machines, their uh, root and administrative passwords show up on their billboards. Sweet. <laughs> what? So I was wondering, what's the most egregious security flaw that you guys have seen, possibly along the similar lines, especially when it's a... Something along that line. I, I think any machine that still has the default password on it <laughs> is probably in that category. Or website. I've seen some websites that the uh, WordPress login was admin admin. Yeah. <laughs> I had uh, 
when we had gotten acquired by a very large company, their HR system was vulnerable to account enumeration. So basically what you saw in the SQL injection demo, if I say one and I pick number two, I could see another employee that wasn't someone who reported to me. So I had access to the entire 200,000 employees, their salaries, how much stock options they had, the entire company just by changing the IDs. And I was thinking, well, you know what? I want to know what the big guys make. I don't want to plow through 200,000 IDs. So what I did, just out of curiosity, we had a web portal, like many of your companies probably have a web portal. You go on and look. And I thought, what happens if I put my employee ID and hit search? And what came back was a Excel spreadsheet got indexed with every single employee ID number in there and their name. And so I could go through and pick out specific employees now that I wanted to look up. So that was, that was I, a bad I, I got to go. Uh, company I used to work for, uh, SharePoint site had search dot, you know, company dot com, uh, and searched all all sorts of SharePoint uh, sites, and um, and and if you put the right permission on the files on SharePoint, it you couldn't see it. You know, and so therefore you could secure it. So you basically have, hey, my security team has this little SharePoint site and it's secure, right? Only my, my security team can see it. Um, I wanted the BIOS password for my laptop because they gave me a laptop and I wanted to turn on the little VMware setting and I wanted to log in to VMware. So I Googled uh, BIOS password, or not Googled, but search.company.com and, and searched the SharePoint site for the BIOS passwords. Now, SharePoint's nice. They gave you a little preview of the page, even if you're not able to see it, you can preview like about a line and it says BIOS password colon right there. I couldn't click the link and actually see the page because they had secured it. But you know, uh, SharePoint and all of its lovely gave me a little preview and actually a little, little, little graphic too of, of the page. And, 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 and so it was an Excel, web, it was an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, but yeah, I was able to get the, the BIOS password from, from that, my, my super. I, I did a, uh, a pen test once where we had uh, over 20% of the organization's users had the same password. So was, that was kind of an interesting. Who were down to the it last was, time? It was, it was spring 2017, I think. Wow. Yeah, like that. We're, down, we're down to the last minute and a half, so yeah. urgent questions only, and then you can come back to Hacker 201 tomorrow night if you want to ask more. Uh, and just as an advertisement, I'm doing hacking mobile applications tomorrow. So I am uh, have examples of mobile apps that have been hacked over the past couple years and things that have run through our company. Anonymized, of course, you won't say anything good, but uh, <laughs> any company names. But uh, I'm going to be demonstrating uh, uh, severe uh, critical application vulnerabilities on mobile apps. So if you want to be a hacker right now, get out your phone. Go to the DragonCon app. <laughs> look up Hacking 101. And rate us all five stars, and I guarantee you, you will get a hacking certificate in the mail. <laughs> we'll get a sticker. We'll give you a C sticker. COD. We'll send you a link to click on to get it. <laughs> all right, yeah. just just a couple more questions, and we'll be done. Here. Just a couple more. A couple. Uh, we're at I'm still trying yeah, to we... figure out whatever happened to Telco Bob. Oh, we're out. Tel what? Telco what? That's I'm it. still trying to figure out whatever happened to Telco Bob. Telco Bob. Huh? Oh, the guy that was in prison that we chatted with for a bit. Oh. Oh yeah. I remember. Uh, what happened? Last time. He was supposed Scott, to tell us a story like three years Scott ago, and he never showed up. <laughs> Scott, you know. <laughs> the guy that was in the uh, the guy that was in the jail that we talked to a bit. I think they're talking about the guy who put up an anonymous FTP server that people oh, can no, just okay, store sorry, information different on. Guy. Different guy. Sorry. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Okay. He's supposed to be released. Okay, doesn't matter. Five, five to ten, that's what we're hearing. All yeah. right, all right. And we're hanging around too, so out here we can yeah, talk yeah, if people yeah, have we're more just questions. Yeah, we out of this room so that other people can come in. So everybody out? Yeah, Thank you down. for coming Thanks, to Hacking Thanks, 101. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you at 201. See you tomorrow at 201.